Tonight, um, I want to welcome you all. But sorry, I first should say something nice to our musicians, Jamie McLaren and Mr. Wolf on violin and uh, cello. Thank you very much for your music. My name is Monique Knappen, and I am director of the John Adams Institute. Very proud that tonight we have a full house for a very special speaker, Jeremy Rifkin. He will talk in a minute about his European dream, and I believe much more. We try to ask him to fit into the John Adams format, which means about 30, 40 minutes, but I hope he will stick to that. Um, but before we get a chance to listen to uh, Jeremy, we'll have... Um, um, a very esteemed board member of the John Adams Institute and a very well-known writer, journalist and uh, friend, Tracy Metz. She will introduce uh, Jeremy in a moment. And then, without a break, Jeremy will give his talk. After his talk, we'll have a discussion together with Jeremy and um, Tracy. And, but you will be asked to interfere and ask questions uh, if you have them. And use them as, please, the... The microphones, which you can see somewhere in the aisles, because we try to record it this uh, evening as well. So we try to stop at about well 9.30, 9.45, without a break. Um, there will be books for sale. Mr. Rifkin will uh, sign his books later on. And for now, hope you will enjoy tonight's evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tracy, are you... Tracy, will you first come up for the introduction? And Mr. Rifkin is coming up. Good evening and welcome. Wonderful that you're all here in such numbers to hear an inspiring speaker like Jeremy Rifkin but you'll have to make do with me in the meantime. As an Ameri um, Monique, my As an American who has lived in Europe now for over half her life, I read Jeremy Rifkin's book, The European Dream, with mixed feelings. On the one hand, of course, it is music to my ears. Thank you. When I came to Europe after college, I could feel the difference, a different pace of life, a less martial attitude towards leaders and towards authority in general, an attachment to things not only material, an understanding of the importance of time off, an approach to building cities that made them both dynamic and livable, as you see all around us every day in Amsterdam. All these things and more changed the course of my own life. On the other hand, I am an American. That means that in spite of myself, I worry that Rifkin may be right. It is there for all to see that the American dream is languishing, as he says. In a recent piece in The Guardian, the historian Timothy Garton Ash compared the US to a, a weary titan and stated that the end of the American century, that be, the end of the American century that began in 1945 can already be glimpsed on the horizon. Sad to say, for the majority of Americans, rags to riches in a land of limitless possibilities where you can always walk off into the sunset and reinvent your upwardly mobile self is now an unattainable dream, a marketing concept rather than a feasible reality. No wonder that one out of four Americans now sees violence as an accepted way of getting what he wants. This statistic I attribute to Mr. Rifkin. The amazing thing about the American dream in this context is its tenacity. Two thirds of Americans still say they believe in it, even while they struggle to make ends meet in spite of holding down two jobs with far too little time for their children and their friends and two weeks vacation a year if they're lucky. And what do they do with that itty bitty time off that they have? They come walk around the open air museum that much of Europe has become and marvel at how beautiful and livable a place it is. Rifkin's visit here at the John Adams Institute couldn't have been better times, <laughs> except for the fact that he's not here yet, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's reinventing himself as we speak. 
<laughs> Europe is sorely in need of some encouragement after all the depressing news of alone this week. Yesterday in Brussels, Barroso admitted that there would not be a European constitution for two to three years to come. Last weekend, the Germans held elections that only deepened the rifts and the political muddle. One of the newspapers here had as a headline, Germans bring chaos upon themselves. And this week, the Dutch heard that Holland's contribution to Europe is going up yet again. For what, many people wonder. Having said that, what with John Roberts, Iraq, and Katrina, the news from the US was at least as bad, if not worse. Fortunately for George W., Hurricane Rita is blowing another chance his way to show how capable he really is. <laughs> Rifkin sees the, the European Union as an emerging superpower of a new kind. The American dream is slowly being eclipsed by its counterpart, the European dream, which focuses on sustainable development, quality of life, and the nurturing of community. Sounds a little politically correct to me, actually. The European dream, he I can say these things because he's not here yet. <laughs> the European dream, Rifkin says, is, I quote, the first truly global vision befitting a globalized economy. The old world has brought forth the new vision. There are many voices out there saying similar things. The ranks of Europe's passionate defenders are swelling. The New York Magazine Village Voice recently chronicled the wave of young Americans moving to Europe for affordable housing and affordable schooling. The State Department estimates, estimates that three million Americans are living abroad, a number that has doubled in the past 30 years. In an interview just last week in NRC Handelsblatt, <clears throat> the 31-year-old <laughs> Englishman Mark Leonard, director of the Center for European Reform, talks about his book with the title, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. Indeed, welcome. How do you do? Good evening, welcome. Mark Leonard says, the freedom, stability, and well-being make the European way of life, life irresistible. The Dutch author, Donald Kolf, who is with us here this evening, published a book on a similar theme last year called Beyond American Capitalism, The Rise of the European Enterprise Model, in which he predicts the demise of the short-sighted American approach to business and its adulation for shareholder value. Kolf is a staunch believer in Europe's ability to create a business model that is based on trust and cooperation. He even believes that Europe can break America's hegemony in the world economy. We'll hear more from Mr. Kolf later. But there are also equally passionate detractors, or perhaps I should say skeptics. John Vinicure, columnist with the International Herald Tribune, who will never pass up an opportunity to say something nasty about Europe, wrote this week that the German elections are, I quote, a blow to Europe's hopes of economic and social renewal anytime soon. Even Holland's own fervently pro-European Minister of Economic Affairs, Laurent Brinkhorst, frets in public about the slow economic growth, the high unemployment, the aging population, and the competition from India and China. And last week, columnist Roger Cohen devoted a thoughtful column, also in the International Herald Tribune, to the future of America. He asks rhetorically, is America at or past its apogee? Nobody knows, says Cohen, but I think not. The 21st century is more likely to be American than anything else. So who is right? Jeremy Rifkin has provided Europe with a rejuvenating elixir in book form, that's for sure. Balsam for a wounded soul. But is it more than a pep talk for the tired old world? Is it an exercise in wishful thinking? Is it an encouraging chirp from cloud cuckoo land? Or is it a simple ineluctable statement of fact? Read, listen, and judge for yourselves. Mr. Rifkin, the floor is yours.
This is going to be a little tight. Okay. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to be here with you. <clears throat> Where are my American countrymen and countrywomen? Raise your hand. Uh, and uh, my Europeans? How many, don't know, how many don't know what your affiliation is? You're totally confused. Existential dread and doubt. How many Americans are here who are married to Europeans and vice versa? Oh, we're going to have a good time. You're going to have endless arguments after this. OK. My father, Milton Rifkin, he was born in 1908 in Denver, Colorado. 15 years after the official closing of the American frontier. My mother, Vivette, was born in 1911 in El Paso, Texas, on the Mexican border. Frontier territory. She's still doing great at 94. My siblings and I, I have a twin sister, two older sisters. We were born in Colorado in the West. In 1945, the last year of the war, we moved to Chicago. We were babies. And we grew up on the southwest side of the city, working class community, steel workers, men and women who worked in the great American stockyards. My mother still lives in that house 60 years later. I grew up on the American dream, in the heartland, as we say, of America. That dream's a very simple dream. America's a tough country. We all know this. But it's a land of opportunity. You get a good public education, you work hard, you can make a success out of your life in America. We did it. All the immigrants that come, came to America from the Netherlands and all over Europe and the world, they sacrificed, their children had a better life. Our dream was real. It was robust. We have to recall that as late as 1960, my country, was the most middle-class, egalitarian country of the OECD countries. Today, I have to reportfully, regretfully re report to you, the American dream has plummeted. We now rank 24th among industrial countries in income disparity, the gap between the very rich at the top and millions of working people and poor at the bottom. Only Mexico and Russia have greater disparity of income. For the Americans here, isn't this surprising to us, right? And you remember that eight-part series in the New York Times a few months ago, finally discovering inequality in the rich and the poor. Of course, all of us actually rediscovered it again in the faces of all the people in New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. And my friends, those poor people you saw there, the Americans can tell you, that's not just the Gulf Coast. There's poverty all over America, across the country. Some are doing very well. A lot of us aren't doing so well. So today, barely 51% of Americans say they still believe in the American dream. A third of Americans, according to a Ford Foundation survey, say we just don't believe in the dream anymore. Now that is very, very problematic because, as you know, the American dream is the glue. This is what keeps us together. When a native born and an immigrant lock eyes in America, we have a little covenant. You do good, you work hard, you succeed, and I will congratulate you. In fact, we don't envy success. Bill Gates, they don't envy Bill Gates in America. They say, good for you. I want to be like that. Today, the American dream's in trouble. Our country is polarized. We've had 40 years of increasingly di divided Americans, family to family, region to region, community to community. Meanwhile, over here on the other side of the Atlantic, a new dream is emerging. It's embryonic. It's weak. It's been under the radar screen. It began with your grandparents, the baby boomers, and now the E generation. It, in fact, you didn't even know you had a dream. <laughs> One Italian said to me, I thought only Americans had dreams. Thank God you didn't know you had a dream. Because had you known you had a dream, you would have argued it to death in Brussels or here in Amsterdam. But I've been coming over here for many, many years, over 20 years. And I spend 40, 50% of my time here. You do have a dream. We're going to talk about it tonight. And the interesting thing about this dream that's emerged here, it's in some ways the mirror opposite of the American dream. It may be a better fit 
for re-globalization of the world from the bottom up. The jury's still out. I'm not sure if you can pull it off. Let me be uh, brutally honest with you. My European friends, you're always talking about America, thinking about America, angsting about America, wondering about America, every conversation, America, 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 right? Can I let you in on a little secret? We never think about you at all. I'm sorry, you're not on the radar screen. Americans, do we sit at home at night? What do the Dutch think? I'm curious about what the Germans or the Brits have to say tonight. We don't even have you on our television screens. Come to America. It's America-centric. You know this. This isn't altogether true. When we, we do think of you, when it's time to vacation. Now, this is kind of serious because we only get five to 10 days off a year here. <laughs> That's discretionary to the employers. So we've got to really take seriously our downtime. And when we think of vacation, we think of you. This is serious because when we want to revitalize our spirits, feed our soul, come, come in touch with our humanity for a few days a year, we flock over here. We sense you have something to give us. We're not sure what it is, but we want it. Otherwise, why would we be coming here to spend our few days a year? But when we think of institutional Europe in the heartland of America, this is kind of the view you tend to get in my family out in the Midwest and the West. My family. Anti-market bias over here. Inflexible labor policies. Pampered workers. Aging population. Welfare system ready to collapse. Everyone dependent on the state. A museum. Does this sound right? We hear this argument increasingly in Europe. There may be some truth to this. But what we're missing is there's a deeper reality that's emerged over the last three generations in Europe, and we are all asleep, including some of our so-called experts and professionals here on the continent. 455 million people across 25 member countries from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia have come together and defied the odds of history, and in less than three generations have created the first transnational governing space in the history of the world. This is what you did. We're all confused about the European Union. I can tell you, I, I work with heads of state. I work with the commission in Brussels. We are completely confused. Absolutely no one knows what the EU is. We can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. Why? There's no precedent. The EU, everyone's winging it. This is a work in process without any roadmap whatsoever because this is the strangest political experiment in the annals of our species. Every other nation in history, every empire, every kingdom has been born in violence, coercion, seizing people in territory, exploiting resources, revolution, even the American democracy. We had to genocide the aboriginal population. We brought the African slaves to improve our commerce. We had a revolution. The EU is counterintuitive. Your parents looked around the rubble in 1945, all of Europe destroyed. And they said, we're now sick to our stomach. We're finally done. It's over. You know, I'm not naive about Europe. I'm mindful every time I step on European soil. More blood is in this soil than any place else in the world. You are the warriors of the world. 2,000 years of bloodshed, hatred animosity, conflict, two world wars, the Holocaust. And you finally said, we're done. We're going to put down the sword forever. We're going to try to figure a new way to govern each other. We don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to have to be based on reciprocity and trust and building bridges of peace and cooperation. You are to be forgiven for the short-sightedness of Europe. Look what you have accomplished. This is not a pep talk tonight. I'm talking to you as an observer who's seeing something quite extraordinary that's happened here in Europe. You have open borders. You have a young generation that's celebrating each other's cultures. Today, one third of all the young people in Europe from the ages of 18 to 31 say they feel European first. That's a sea change. Can you imagine your parents and grandparents here in Amsterdam saying I'm European first? That doesn't mean young people aren't still Dutch, but they also have another loyalty. They're European, they're people of the world. It's a more cosmo cosmopolitan type of identity. 
I should say this about the EU and Brussels, just for a moment. If you've ever spent any time in Brussels, it's like the monk painting, the scream. You want to scream. It's agonizing, excruciating. You can't find out where the center of authority is. Who's in charge here? Now, Americans, what does it say on the White House desk on the plaque that Harry Truman left? The buck stops here. There's no plaque in Brussels. There's no place where the buck stops. When Henry Kissinger once said, if I call Europe, who answers the phone? <laughs> you know what the answer is. Everyone in Europe, all at the same time with their own opinions. <laughs> the intergovernmentalists, like the UK, thought, well, we'll have a free trade zone, and it'll, it'll improve our national sovereignty. Some, like Monet and Schumann and Adenauer, said, no, we'll create a federalist superstate. They both lost. While they're still arguing this, something else happened. It's called Network Europe. As excruciating as it is, this is the first example of network politics, if you spend any time in Brussels. I teach at the Wharton School of Business, the oldest business school in the world. I've been there a long time. And I teach your business leaders in the advanced management program. Many of them have come through my programs over the years. And we teach them, try to teach them, how to go from markets to networks. In a network, it's not like a market. In a market, you have winners and losers. In a market, it's caveat emptor, don't share the information. It's combat. In a network, however, because no party can dominate the game, in this case, no country, no region, no NGO, no corporation, you have to find ways to get your agenda across by going into consensus with everybody else's interest. It's excruciatingly slow in Brussels. You have to optimize the interest of the group to optimize your own interests. That's a flip-flop to the, to the Adam Smith dictum that each person pursues their own self-interest and that equals the common good. This is a different ball game. So we have Network Europe. It's excruciatingly slow. It's redundant. But it is horizontal politics. There is no command and control at the top. The interesting thing about it is, with all of its difficulties, it actually works. It doesn't work well. It should be more democratic at the grassroots. But at every time we thought the EU was going to fail, it stumbled to the next leg of its journey and defied the logic of history. I need to make an apology. For many years over here, I misjudged the minds of you Europeans. I used to think we all think alike. We're family. We come from the same tree. But maybe Europeans have different style. In fact, you cross your legs differently. So that's you're a European, right? See how they cross their legs? We don't do that. We do it open, you see. We have all sorts of different gestures and body language. And, but guess what? It took me a long time to realize you think differently than we do. I'll put the Brits on the side. They're a bit of an anomaly. <laughs> in fact, the way to solve the British problem, fill in the damn channel. Fill it in, and then they'll realize they belong to Europe. Is that a good solution? <laughs> fill it in. OK. You'll build it. OK. Yeah, you're good at levees and dikes and stuff. All right. When an American uses basic concepts like freedom, which is the core of our dream, we have something completely different in mind than when you in Europe use core concepts like freedom, which is your dream. It's really different. An American parent teaches their child that freedom is autonomy and mobility. That's why we love the automobile. It's a surrogate for the cowboy on the horse. And every American knows, 16 years old, you get the driver's license, freedom, autonomy, mobility. We're taught to be self-sufficient, to be independent, to swim or sink, to be personally accountable for our lives. The government isn't going to take care of us. Our neighbors may be charitable, but you're on your own. Learn how to go it alone. Be a man. Be a woman. Take charge of your life. Am I right, Americans? In Europe, the parents don't teach the kids that. It's a different idea here. You teach your children that the freedom, the core of your dream, is directly relationship to the quality of your life, the quality of your relationships, and the quality of the communities you're a part of. Ask an American what the dream is, we'll say personal opportunity to succeed in whatever I choose. Ask a European what your dream is, that I should be able to have a good quality of life for myself and my children. That's your signature. Why the difference? I'm overgeneralizing. We can find many people that fall in between. But to understand the American dream, it's a European transplant. 
That's what's so ironic about this. Put yourself back 200 years ago. When our founders came to America, and we had a lot of people from the Netherlands that settled New Amsterdam in New York, a lot of early immigrants came over. And what time was that 200 years ago? It was the last stages of the Protestant Reformation in Europe and the very early beginnings of the European Enlightenment, two big ideas in European history. We took those ideas across the Atlantic 200 years ago, and we froze them in their pure form for 200 years. We are the most Protestant, the most Christian, the most reformational of any country in the world, and we're the fiercest champions of the ideas of the Enlightenment. We found more fertile soil for your ideas than you did. If Martin Luther or John Calvin were to come back today, they'd feel much more comfortable in the heartland of America than in Europe, correct? If Adam Smith, the great Scottish economist of the Enlightenment, were to come back today, he'd feel much more comfortable with the unfettered marketplace in America than the social economy in Europe. Agreed? Okay. So why did we run with your idea? Many Europeans say to me, we don't understand you Americans. How can you be so religious and then so materialistic? It just doesn't seem to connect. In our minds, there's no contradiction. The Reformation and the Enlightenment are so different, but we see a common thread. The Protestant Reformation said, suffer with Christ and accept Christ, and you get eternal salvation in the next world. The Enlightenment thinkers upended that. Descartes and Condorcet and Newton and Locke, they said, no, no. Pursue happiness on earth, and we'll give you material progress now. Completely different ideas. What joins them in an American mind is that the individual is at the core of both of those currents of thought. Martin Luther said, you stand alone, naked and alone, you and your Bible, you and God, alone. No Vatican, no priesthood, no intermediaries. Remember, up to that time, all religions in the world were communal and paternalistic. He separated out the individual from the flock. Adam Smith upended 2,000 years of economic history. Remember, economy comes from the Greek and Latin oikos, family. He said, no, we strip the economy out of the family. You stand naked and alone. Pursue your self-interest in the market. And John Locke said, you stand alone with nature. Harness the commons. Turn it to productive property with your labor. This resonated with us in America. We were alone. It was a frontier. So the idea of the individual being self-sufficient, autonomy, mobility, independence, swimmers sink, go it alone, be an island, it helped us tame a frontier. It helped us become a people. In Europe, you had older traditions which tempered the individualism of the Reformation and the Enlightenment, to begin with the Catholic Church. Communal, the great chain of being, St. Thomas Aquinas' great ladder, everyone has obligations and responsibilities to everyone else. Paternalistic, hierarchical, communal. Walled cities, same. Feudal society, same. So you had an older communal, albeit paternalistic tradition, which tempered the individualism of the Reformation, the Enlightenment. The result is you have a social economy on the continent in the 21st century. We have the individual in an unfettered market. And we're having the debate, which model is better for Europe and hopefully maybe for America? Huh? So most Americans, uh, success is, multi is multifaceted, but for a lot of us, we have to make enough money. Now, money is not a me an end to us. It's a means. It's not that we love money, but our parents tell us the government's not going to take care of you. Your neighbors aren't. You better learn to have enough property so you're not a drain on society and can be independent. Right, Americans? Take care of yourself. In Europe, you spend less time on personal accumulation of wealth because as a class-based society with feudal traditions, you couldn't just become rich. So you settle for a collective exercise. You each tax each other, and quality of life becomes your signature. We spend 11% of our GDP on redistribution of benefits. You spend 26%. The American dream is based on growth. We like to take the frontier and turn it into residential communities. Suburban developments. <laughs> in Europe, you spend time on growth, but you have another attachment, which you call sustainable development. Now, sure, some NGOs talk about that in America. I can tell you there's never been a time in my family where they've ever brought that term up at the dinner table. Why is it that you signed the global warming treaty we didn't? 
You signed the Biodiversity Treaty. We didn't. You're going to sign chemical legislation to regulate chemicals. We won't. You tax your gasoline. We don't. You save energy. We don't. Why? Is it because you're better people? No. There's a sub-theme in my book that the great changes in history are temporal and spatial, that there are qualitative moments in history where the technology allows us to compress time and space in a new way so we can increase the density of exchange between human beings. Cuneiform and agriculture, the steam engine and the print press, you get my drift. By the 18th century, I would say, how many of you visited America from Europe and spent a few months traveling by car? OK, you did your after-college American experience, right? Do you, do you notice how sometimes you'll go through a community that's maybe 70, 80 years old and it's blight, falling apart, doesn't look good, not maintained. Ten minutes later, in the middle of a cornfield, brand new community from scratch, without even a name. Why? We have so much land, still do, so that if we spoil our nests, we can move on and build something new. In Europe, you were so spatially dense by the 19th century, you had no more frontier. You could not escape. You had to not understand not to foul your nest. So you use your environment carefully. Go to central and southern Europe, the poor parts, and you'll see how they still steward with zoning because they know it's precious. So it's no mistake that you would be into biosphere politics and not just geopolitics. The American dream focuses on the work ethic. We work the longest hours in the world. We work longer than the Koreans. We work 1,900 hours a year. We work. Why? It's our religiosity. And you don't have to be Protestant. You can be Jewish. You can be an atheist. You can be Catholic. We say idle hands are the devil's workshop. You Europeans ever hear that one? When we hear the word idle, well, here's why. Idle to us is a sin. Idle means you're sloth, you're sinful, you're lazy, you're not productive. Why? Remember Martin Luther and John Calvin, their theology was kind of tough. They said, you're elected at damned at birth. Forget the Catholic idea that you can lobby your way into heaven by doing good things like Mother Teresa. You're not going to lobby your way into heaven. Elected or damned at birth. But how can you live with that, not knowing? So Calvin said... You increase your calling, be productive, and it'll give you a sign that you may have been elected. It won't change anything. So when we hear the word idle, we hear the word sin. When a European hears the word idle, you hear, ah, time to go to the cafe. <laughs> time to reacquaint myself with nature, take a walk. Ah, speaking of which, watch what I'm doing here. And tell me the last time you saw anyone in America doing this. You ready? is called strolling. If you see an American walking down the street like that, you think they've been escaped from a mental ward or on a drug trip. <laughs> Am I right? In Europe, you're all strolling, even the young people. We take photographs of you strolling, and we say strolling, and we put it in the scrapbook. <laughs> strolling, a European thing. You Europeans say to Americans, you live to work. I confess I'm the worst victim. Europeans say we prefer to work to live, balance work and play. That's across Europe. There's so many differences in Europe. I'm trying to outline what I think are the common denominators. The American dream focuses on property rights and civil rights because they extend our individuality. If I have property, I'm not beholden. It's a good quality in a way. I'm independent. I'm not dependent on the state. If I have civil rights, the right to freedom of expression, the right of free speech and assembly, the right to bear guns, I'm an island to myself, and no one will tell me what to do. I don't have to tell you what to do, but you don't tell me what to do. It's kind of negative freedom. In Europe, you don't spend a heck of a lot of time on property rights or civil rights. You spend a lot of time on social rights, the right to health care, the right to retirement benefits, the right to maternity leave, the right to paid vacation. And you spend time on what you call international universal human rights. Jimmy Carter may talk about universal human rights, but in my family, I've never heard the term used. Maybe in San Francisco, maybe in New York and Washington, but not where my family resides. That doesn't mean they're not good people. They might be attracted to it, but it's not on the screen. 
The American dream focuses, <coughs> excuse me, on religion. We're the most religious, the most Protestant, the most Christian of any industrial country. 93% of us have a Bible. A majority of us pray every day, go to religious services once a week. A slim majority believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible, word for word. A not quite a slim majority, about 50%, believe in the creation story as opposed to evolution, maybe a little under 50% now. A majority of Americans, a slim majority, believe in the final battle of Armageddon as laid out in the book of Revelation by John, that there will be a end, end days in the Middle East. The Antichrist will come back, and those who have been saved will be physically resurrected to heaven. You may roll your eyes, but believe me, this is heartfelt. My family, some are religious, many families I know. Of course, the scary thing is 25% of Americans believe we are in the end times. Two presidents did. And that the Antichrist is alive and living in Europe. That's the new theory. I, I have to tell you something interesting. I was with uh, my old friend Mikhail Gorbachev. We were at dinner a few months ago celebrating the 20th anniversary of perestroika. And I kept looking at that little mark on his forehead. Because in the fundamentalist Christian movement, as you Americans know, they thought that was the mark of the beast, that he was the Antichrist. Now that he's out of power, they have to switch, but no one knows who the new Antichrist is. But here's the fun thing. A majority of us in America believe in heaven and hell, vast majority, but only 6% of us think we're going down there. We're very confident about ourselves. But, you know, on the other hand, lest you be too amused, it worries me when I come to Amsterdam and I see no transcendent spirit when the secular becomes so overwhelming that there's no sense of anything beyond our immediate existential existence. What happens to society when it loses the spiritual dimension? Not religious institutionalism, but the spiritual quest. It's just equally scary to me on both sides of the Atlantic. I don't know if you share that, but all right. The American dream is involved with patriotism. Surveys of 50 countries show we're the most patriotic. Our kids will die for their country, sometimes in wars we shouldn't be in. Conversation for later. In Europe, yes, you're patriotic. Go to a soccer game. The Dutch are patriotic. But when we talk patriotism in relation to politics, you get nervous. It sounds like the bad old days of the 1930s of hate, animosity. You want to get beyond that. You want to move to biosphere politics, to global politics. Awareness, correct? The American dream finally is heavily engaged with military. Yes, there's a military industrial complex. Yes, they make a lot of money, but you have arms dealers here too, do the same thing. The reason so many Americans sport a military in the heartland is we believe that evil is not a metaphor. A majority of Americans, when they hear about the empire, evil empire, the axis of evil, you think that's a slick metaphor. It is not. A little over 50% of the Americans believe that evil actually exists. It's real. The devil is real. And who's to say they're wrong? And you have to have a strong, powerful, but just military when evil rears its head. So here's how I would sum it up. I should say also, in Europe, you say, we've been down this path with swords, build peace. I have to say, no one's more fond of Europe, but when I get in a dinner conversation and the Europeans say, oh, you hegemons, you are military hegemons, and I think all the years our young men and women in uniform in harm's way protecting interest here, it should count for something. If it wasn't for American troops, Bosnia and Kosovo still may be a war zone. On the other hand, as we say Talmudically Aristotelian, on the other hand, you do walk the walk for peace. You do put more money into reconstruction assistance without strings attached foreign aid, humanitarian assistance, and policing powers in post-conflict situations. Maybe we need to learn from each other. Here's how I'd sum it up. American dream, individual opportunity to succeed. Here's what I think your dream is. You tell me if I'm right, all right? Remember now, dreams are what you'd like to be, not what you are. That's why they're dreams. We Americans have never totally lived up to our dream. I think that across Europe, the baby boomers in the E generation believe in inclusivity that we should never abandon someone totally to the market on their own, that we have some obligation to take care of those who need some social net across Europe. Two, a belief in multicultural diversity. Europe's the most diverse region in the world. We should respect pluralism and see cultures as a gift to share, in theory. Three, a belief in quality of life. That's your signature. Collective exercise, build a good quality of life for the community. Four, 
Sustainable development, our fellow creatures count, the earth counts, we're in a single biosphere. You walk the walk there. Fifth, balance work and play. Work to live, don't live to work. Six, social and human rights, we need to promote them. And seventh, build peace. We're in an interconnected world. We have to figure out how to learn to live together. Is that the dream? Am I saying you're living up to it? Of course not. I could spend hours on all the shortfalls in Europe, the prejudices, the biases, the anti-Semitism, the fear of Muslim immigration, the democratic deficit in Brussels, the rich countries fighting the poor countries. It is a mess. But so is every political region in the world, in case you've stopped to look. What interests me is not the shortfalls. That's transparent. What interests me as an observer of Europe is this is the first time in history that I know of where a collective part of the human race has dared to dream a dream, as thin as it is, that attempts global consciousness. Inclusivity, multicultural diversity, quality of life for the community, sustainable development for the planet, social and human rights, build peace. That is a global consciousness. That is the principles you hear at Porto Alegre with the young activists. That's not what you hear at Davos at the World Economic Forum. It may fail. It may prove too thin, and I'm not sure if the young people in this room have the, the strength and the courage and the conviction to lead. I just don't know. It's an open-ended question in my mind. But this is re-globalization from the bottom up. You may fail. Maybe someone else will take this dream up. And this isn't just a dream. There's reality here. It's not just you're dreaming. The problem with the reality is everyone in Europe has self-doubt. Some self-loathing, a lot of self-doubt. It's happened since World War II. I, if I were in Europe and I had experienced World War II, I would have self-doubt and some loathing as well. But what happens is if America has a superiority complex, and I will admit that some of us, you know, we do this. We're always talking about America, 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 and you, it puts you to sleep at the table. But at the other hand, my European friends tend to have an inferiority complex. We hype our successes, you hype your failures. When's the last time, you see what I'm saying, when's the last time you heard an American economist or business person talk about failures? It's not that we hide from them, they're boring. That was yesterday, come up with a new idea. It's the American can do, right? In Europe, so many of my business friends and labor friends, some activists, they're always thinking about what didn't work, can't work, probably won't work. Certainly, I say to them, can you think of any successes you've had in the last 50 years? There's been so many. You've created the first political space in history based on peace. But it's not only that. Look at the economic accomplishments. And I'm going to be hard on the problems as well. But look at the accomplishments just for a moment. We think of America as a great economic superpower, and Europe is falling apart a museum, correct? Here's the reality on the ground. The European Union's gross domestic product exceeded the GDP of the United States of America in 2003. We went a little ahead of you last year. We're about even. The European Union is the largest exporting power in the whole world, not the US, not China. In fact, the next time we lament poor old Germany on the rocks, 82 million people in that little country, it's the largest exporter in the world, larger than America with 280 million people. It exports more than China and India with a billion each. How do you like that? That's old Germany falling apart. They must be doing something right. The problem is they had to integrate a whole generation of Eastern Germans in one generation, and they're not yet there. The European Union is the largest internal commercial trading market in the world, not the US, not China. 61 of the 140 largest Fortune 500 companies are in Europe. Only 50 are in the US. You lead in key industries. 14 of the 20 largest banks, they're in Europe. You lead across the board in the insurance industry. You lead in aerospace with Airbus. You lead in the chemical industry, engineering, construction, food, wholesale, retail. These are pretty big industries. Now, we Americans, we took over in pharmaceuticals. You used to lead. We lead in auto and software, a lot of industries. But there are two economic superpowers. There may be only one military superpower. There are two economic superpowers. But first, Europe has to take responsibility for its role and its leadership in the world. It hasn't happened yet. It's starting. Part of it's geographic. We're still comparing Germany to the US. Wrong. We're still comparing France to the US, the UK to the US. Wrong. Wrong. 
Since Maastricht, you are a political union. You have been since 1992. Whether or not you ever vote for the Constitution, you are a political union. The companies I work with in Europe, their regulatory regime's Brussels. You think they think I'm a Dutch company, I'm a German company, I'm a French company? Not anymore. It means we have to change our concept of geography. We have to compare Germany to California. Germany's the largest state in your union. California's the largest state in our union. Germany's a bigger population, but its economy trumps California. Then you have to compare the UK, your second largest state to New York. The UK trumps the New York economy. Then the big problem, France. <laughs> you have to compare France, your third largest state. Are you ready, Americans and Europeans? Texas. <laughs> this is tough. This is the big divide. France trumps Texas. Now, I said this in St. Mary's College, Americans in San Antonio, people roaring with laughter on the floor, good-natured. I said it in Paris a few months later, roaring on the floor, good-natured laughter. So there's something going on that's not so bad. <laughs> then you have to compare Italy to Florida, Spain to Illinois. Do you see what I'm doing? If you go state by state in your union, compare it to our union, we begin to see the magnitude and scope. We've got another player to play with. I think that's good for America, not a competitor another partner that we can help together to make this a better world, correct? When they ask Europeans, why do you want to be a, do you want to be a superpower, most Europeans say yes. Then when you ask Americans, do you want Europe to be a superpower, most Americans say no, it's a threat. But then when you ask Europeans, why do you want to be a superpower, a majority say so we can be better partners with America. Is that interesting? On the surveys. All right. And there's been real accomplishments. If you measure the good economy by paycheck, we're 28% richer than you are, you know that we have bigger homes, more lots, plasma TVs, and SUVs. We, are, we have more. That's more unequally divided, but we have more stuff. As George Carlin would say, stuff. We got a lot of stuff. In Europe, in Europe, it's a little bit of a different story in Europe. In Europe, if you measure the good economy by quality of life, which is your signature, you get a whole different reading about the strength of your economy. You passed us up in the 90s. Take education. If you want a good graduate school education, I would encourage you to come to America. You have some good universities here, but we have so many good graduate schools. You know that. But at the elementary and secondary school level, 18 European countries, your kids outperform our kids in math now. That's 18 countries. Healthcare, if you're seriously ill, you can afford the best treatment, you'll go to the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, we can take care of you if you've got money. But as you Americans know, we have 40 million Americans without health care insurance. The only other country that hasn't socialized medicine in the industrial countries is South Africa. You have more doctors per population in the EU 15. You live a year longer than we do, which astounds me since you still smoke so much. <laughs> what is it, the wine, the beer, or, oh, it's the, here, it's, is it the drugs, what is it? I'm not sure what it is. You have much lower infant mortality rates. Shouldn't that be the sign of a prosperous economy that our children have a life? We rank 27th in infant death. It's shameful. We have reason why we have much more infant death? Poverty. You have terrible poverty. I've seen it all over Europe. It's bad. But American poverty is actually worse. One out of our every five kids is in absolute <laughs> poverty. When you saw those pictures in New Orleans, those pictures in New Orleans, that isn't just New Orleans and the Gulf Coast. I'm not saying it's all of America, but Americans, is that just New Orleans? Of course not. That doesn't mean we don't have a thriving upper middle class, a lot of beautiful suburbs, but we have a lot of poverty as well. Bad poverty. So if you're a poor mother, you're single, and you're going to have a kid, you're, there's no social net to really speak of, your child has a better chance of dying in infancy. Leisure. We get five to ten days off a year discretionary to the employer. That's the average. How would you like that here in the Netherlands? Ten days. <laughs> Go nuts. Make use of it. You get four to six weeks off a year, mandated by law, and you get 12 weeks more off the whole year. Now, an American will say, aha, proves my point. They are so lazy, these people, <laughs> simply dependent on the state. Well, I'm the first to say there's too much paternalism here. It's the older communal tradition. Someone's going to take care of me. And I'm sure some of you believe you've got to reform these social rules. They're way out of hand. But do you give up the social net? I don't think so. Why are we here on Earth? We're here on Earth not just to work. 
My wife always reminds me of the deathbed test because I'm, I'm such an American. She says, do you know anyone on their deathbed that says, I regret I didn't spend another hour at the office? Maybe I could answer a few emails before I check out. <laughs> Finally, safe society. We normally think prosperous economy, safe country. But America has four times the homicide rate of Europe. 25% of the prisoners in the world are incarcerated in my country. 2% of the adult male workforce is now almost 2% in jail. I don't say this with glee. I've been a social activist for 40 years. I remember America that was the standard. I'm, I'm in love with this country. I think there's so many strengths in our country. We've sort of gotten off track, though. Somehow we've gotten off track in the last 30, 40 years. And we've got to get back on track. Maybe there's some ideas over here that will help us. Maybe we have some ideas still in our dream that will help you. I'm saying there's a trade-off. If you think you're going to leave tonight with me saying the American dream is terrible and the European dream is great, uh, disabuse yourself of that. I think that we can learn from each other's dreams. We both have strengths and weaknesses, which I'll get to. So some of you who are neoconservatives in this audience are going to say, OK, Mr. Rifkin, sure. We have a European dream. It's a global vision. Not sure how thick it is. We've had great social programs. We've taken care of each other. But what world are you living in? Wake up. The economy is anemic. The jobs are disappearing. We're in eurosclerosis. We have to give up the dream. We have to give up the programs. And even though we don't want to do it, we're going to have to go to the University of Chicago American unfettered market model. Everyone's on their own. Let the market take over. And everyone's self-interest will equal the common good. It's Darwinian. It's not who we are because we're more communal in Europe. But you know what? You Americans know how to grow your economy. You know how to create jobs. Let me say, I do think that we are more risk-taking. Well, I like that about the American spirit. On the average, Americans like to take a risk. They did a survey, and they asked people in Europe, if you could create a new business and there was a chance it would fail, it would, fail would you do it? And two-thirds said no, they wouldn't do it, take the risk. The exact opposite in America said we take the risk. Maybe the risk takers went over to America. All right? So we have innovation. We have risk taking. I understand that. But I also want to give you another reason why America has grown in the last 15 years, because a lot of neoconservatives here say go, go with the American neoconservative market model. I need to give you an idea of what I think you're going to get and what you're going to give up. First, there's no positive correlation between building a good economy and getting rid of all your social programs. I'm sure they have to be streamlined. But there's only a negative correlation. If you give up your social net, so you he don't help those in need, and you shouldn't help people who are not in need, but those in need, you will build GDP, but it'll be negative. More crime, more prisons, more poverty, more pollution, worse infrastructure. And you'll pay for all of that in the GDP, but it doesn't come out as quality of life. The Netherlands to Finland have shown that it's possible to really overall the net because the dependency is too high here in Europe on the state. Overall it, but keep the principles and grow a market mechanism that's sustainable. The reason the American economy has done moderately all right in the last 15 years is we mortgaged our children's future. It's painful to say this. We came out of the 1989 to 92 recession by issuing credit cards across America. Americans. We started buying on credit, correct? And we bought, bought, bought. We went back to work to make, make, make the goods. And we have been moving the whole world with our consuming dollars by depleting the family savings of the United States of America. The average family savings in my country was 8% in 1990. It's zero as of two months ago. Millions of Americans spend more than they make. This year, more Americans will file bankruptcy than file for divorce or get a heart attack or get cancer or graduate the university. That doesn't sound like a healthy economy. <laughs> then Americans, since our wages have been stagnant and slightly falling because the labor movement has been, has been losing its power to conclude a deal with management, what did we do after we maxed out our credit cards? How do we get a little more cash? Yes, we refinanced our mortgages. We've all done it two or three times because wages are stagnant. We refinanced our mortgages at low interest rates. Now the interest rates are going up, and the stock market bubble, and the real estate bubble, is starting to look a little bit like it may go. Then President Bush gave us two tax cuts to put a little more income for us. And now we have record government deficits. Our trade deficits through the roof. If I'm right or wrong, there's a clear test. 
Check the currency after the lecture. That's the test. Take the business test. Why is the euro stronger than the dollar? We said the euro would be toilet paper in six months. If Europe is so weak and the economy is so dismal and America is so strong and its future is so good, why is the dollar continuing to be devalued against the euro? Because the investment community is clear. You're ridden in debt. We don't think the fundamentals are there, so we're going to continue to devalue your currency against the euro. This does, by the way, did we create jobs? Yeah. We created quite a few jobs in the last few years, but it took us five years to get back so we didn't have net unemployment. Our productivity is higher than yours. We've dramatically sped up beyond you in the last five years. But now that our IT revolution has started to, to plateau, your businesses are just moving toward your IT revolution in business. I think you probably will catch up. I don't know. I'm not sure. But let's say for the sake of argument, by the way, real unemployment in America, 8.9%, not 4.9%. Go on the web of the Labor Department and look at their second statistics. They have a second set of statistics. They talk about what they call the marginally attached worker. Those are workers who are underemployed, working only a few hours, but they want full-time jobs, but they no longer can find them. We count them as employed. Then we have the discouraged workers. They gave up. We don't count them at all. Now, you don't count them either, but you see, the difference is our unemployment benefits run out in six months, so we can put you in the discouraged category faster. Your unemployment benefits can go years, so you stay in the unemployed category. Then we don't count the 1.9% of the adult male workforce that we put in prison in the last 14 years. This doesn't make me feel good to say this. I want the kind of America I know it can be. Let's assume for the sake of argument that some of what I'm saying is correct and the neoconservative agenda, we have the test case in America. From Ronald Reagan through Clinton, through Bush, neoliberals and conservatives had the similar agenda. And the agenda was, the agenda was unfetter the market, privatize, deregulate, let the market run free, and everybody's life will improve. In that same exact period, we went from the most egalitarian country to 24th in income inequality, more poverty, more crime, more imprisonment. That's the record. If our model isn't the right model, what do you do? You, your economy is bad, too. Your unemployment's not good. You're in eurosclerosis. You have an alternative economic model. You have a golden goose. You're starving it to death because of the parochialism of old-fashioned politics. You went to Lisbon, your political leaders, in the year 2000, bless you, and you said, we're going to be the most competitive economy in the world by 2010, and you failed. I was in Brussels this spring. We had the sixth economic summit on economics at the EU, and I gave a talk. We had all the economists there, and I said, how are you doing five years in? You're not doing well. Why? Center right, center left, your politicians came home and they used Europe as the scapegoat. Every time there was a problem domestically they didn't want to deal with, they said, oh, Europe's to blame. Europe's to blame. The golden goose, the alternative model, is the integration of the infrastructure of the single biggest internal market in the world, from the Irish Sea to Russia. You need a single unified transportation grid across the continent in 15 years. You need a seamless power grid, energy grid, and communication grid across the continent in 15 years. You need a single set of policies on capital and labor flows that's just, phased in, and equitable for the new accession countries in 15 years. You need English as lingua franca for business to ease commerce. You have to maintain your languages and social life. Lose the language, lose the culture. Lose the culture, lose the diversity of Europe, and that's your strength. That's your creativity. But if you can learn to engage in commerce with the same ease across your infrastructure as we have across our 50 states, you have almost 500 million people here. You can maintain the dream, sustain development, grow the economy. It can be done. And you have the money. You have the food to feed the goose. You have a higher savings rate, 8 percent. You have a lower relationship between budget deficit and GDP. Yours is 3 percent, ours is 4 percent. You have a better trade deficit, a trade balance. You have money. You should invest it in the infrastructure. And so what I say to Europeans is, does any European in this room really believe that the future prosperity of your children rests in going back into the little Dutch container or integrating the biggest political and commercial space in the world? It's obvious. 
Maybe it's not being done right. Maybe the no vote was to say, we want a deeper Europe. We don't like the way it's going. We want to be heard. I don't know. But does anyone really here think we should go back to nation state dominance? I doubt it. One last thing, and then we'll finish up with the American and European dream. The second biggest door you have to go through, and it's the bigger one, is how do you deal with fertility and immigration? This is a bigger door. I think you could integrate your economy. You may not. You may fail. But your fertility rate's low. You're not reproducing. You're going to be an old age home in 50 years. You're going to have two retirees for every working person. It's not tenable. You can increase fertility. Go to Denmark. There are pregnant women all over the sidewalks. You can't move. Have you been there? I know. It's a, they have a bad soccer team. Nobody's watching. They have good government programs to compensate parents to raise their children. Go to France. Fertility rates are up. 15 million more people by mid-century. They start public school at two and a half preschool. What we ought to do is get rid of some of those outrageous government subsidies to industries, we won't name them, and give parents across Europe enough money so that in the first two years of their child's life, mom and dad can stay home in those first two years and be parents and raise their children. Not necessarily a daycare center. Let parents raise their children. That's their responsibility. You'll have a lot more babies in Europe if you put the money toward child care and maternity leave. Norway's doing it. Both parents get two years off at good compensation. They raise their children. But the bigger problem is you've got to bring in many, many immigrants. Even 100 million won't do it. And the truth be known, it's not about immigration. It isn't the Polish plumber. It's the Muslim young person you're worried about. We Americans, for all our faults, do much better in immigration. We, we struggle, but we invite new blood. We know it's our vitality. We know we struggle with it. But we, we're comfortable with immigration. It, we like it. Canada does well. You don't. You're worried that the young Muslims will come here if you open the doors to Turkey and North Africa and the Middle East, especially Turkey, and they won't respect the pluralism of Europe. They'll take the unskilled jobs and lower the labor costs. They'll collapse the welfare system. There'll be crime. And what you're really worried about here in the Netherlands is right-wing fascist xenophobic political movements. They're all over Europe. They will gain ascendancy with the backlash on immigration, and you'll be back to 1932 again, correct? I say you get what you expect. Lower the bar, wring your hands, and say that this is what's going to happen. I guarantee you it will. You have to take a chapter from America, raise the bar. When John F. Kennedy became president, he said, ask not what America can do for you. Ask what you can do for America. And whoa, what? Then he said, I'm going to create the Peace Corps in VISTA. I was a VISTA, Volunteer in Service to America in Harlem in the early days. He said, I'm going to give our college students after school, a little government stipend, train them, send them all over the world and all over America to help their fellow human being and learn from their fellow human being. He challenged the idealism of the baby boom generation. I'm waiting for someone in Europe to say, ask not what Europe can do for me. What can I do as a young person to make Europe a shining example of a diaspora, a global public square that, that builds peace for the world? Give those Erasmus college students. They're not xenophobic. They're multicultural. They're out in Europe. They're the beginning. Ask them if they would take a year off after school. Give them a little government stipend. Create a welcome corps like our Peace Corps. Send them to the front doors of Amsterdam. Let them welcome in the young Muslim immigrants. Break bread. Help them with language and job skills. Show them that they're wanted. Wrestle with culture, because it isn't going to be a cakewalk. The young people here will say, I don't like the gender issues in Islam. Just because a culture is a culture doesn't mean we have to like all of it. Of course, they might say, I don't like the hedonism of all the young people in Amsterdam. Wrestle with each other. Engage. It'll take a generation, but the alternative is back off, close Europe, and then your dream is really not a dream. It's just a fiction. Last, last thought. I promise. My wife says, I get older, I talk longer. It's terrible. There are strengths in the American dream that I think Europe needs in its dream or your dream won't make it. And there are strengths in the European dream we desperately need in America if we can rejuvenate the American spirit. The strength of America is also its weakness. It's the individual. It's a strength and a weakness. In a frontier, going it alone, being self-sufficient, it made sense. But today, the world's totally interconnected. 
like it or not, the technology is connecting the central nervous system in the human race. We're not ready. We hate each other. We don't even know each other. We're more dependent. We're more vulnerable. You can't have a world that's connecting this fast and have six billion cowboys each pursuing their own individual self-interest naked and alone in the world. It won't work. On the other hand, there's an underbelly to American individuality that I love. Europe could use more of it. Our parents, Americans, tell me if I'm correct, our parents, the first time we come home when we're a little kid and we start whining and complaining that someone else is responsible or someone else is to blame for what I did, remember? What does a parent say? Uh, 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 I never want to hear you again blame someone else for your life, say someone else is responsible. You look me in the eye, I'm going to tell you, you be responsible for your life. You understand that your life is your destiny. You be accountable. Correct, Americans? I love this. There is an older tradition in Europe. I'm, I, it is fading, but an older tradition of someone else is responsible. You can't have a strong global dream and not take personal accountability. That's not a strong dream. I have to be responsible to me before I can be accountable for you. Also, Americans are optimistic. We're hopeful. We're risk takers. You might call it arrogance or naivete, but I like this about America. Our young people are light on their feet. They're optimistic. They hope. They take risks. You cannot have a dream and be a Euroskeptic or a cynic or a pessimist. You're dead in the heart. How can you tell your kids that tomorrow is going to be worse than today? Swim or sink, you're on your own. What kind of a message is that to the kids? If we could take the American sense of personal accountability, our hope, our optimism, our risk-taking, and graft it onto the European dream, the European dream would be a very strong standard. However, what we can learn from the European dream, solidarity, inclusivity, diversity, good quality of life, sustainable development, human rights, and peace. Good trade-off? I think that if we can learn from each other and make a synergy between these two dreams, we have a new standard across the Atlantic and a new partnership that can be a beacon to people all over the world. A lot of the world is looking to the young people in this room. I go to Asia and the Asian tiger tent, Korea and Japan, they're trying to build a union, like the European Union, and they like some of the ideas you're putting forth in your dream, but they're not sure how serious they are. You go to the Mercursor countries of South America, they're looking to Europe now like they looked to America. They're not sure about you. You go to the Organization of African States, same thing. Go to the Middle East. Me, Simon Perez wrote an editorial in the Financial Times or Herald Tribune a few months ago. He said, how about a European Union for the Middle East? And he said, before you laugh, Europeans hated and killed each other for 2,000 years. By their standards, we're not doing so bad here. We haven't had that long. <laughs> And he said, how about a European dream for the Middle East? How about a union? How about a cooperative partnership? The world's looking to Europe. For a long time, the world looked to America. I, the world's still looking to America in some ways, but now it's also looking to Europe. It's good to have more than one set of ideas, right? It's good to have a lot of ideas. Don't let them down. I know you had many reasons for voting no on the Constitution. We can talk about it. But when it comes to the conversation about Europe, you're the standard. You're the laboratory. As bad as it is here, you're the laboratory. If you fail, it puts the world back, right at the time when a younger generation needs to believe that you can maintain your diversity and still live in part of a global family. You have that responsibility. We used to say the American dream's worth dying for. The European dream's worth living for. Good night. Thank you very much for your inspiration. How was your book received in the US, Mr. Rifkin? Have you been accused of anti-Americanism? I know Americans can be, uh, have very long toes when it comes to criticism. You know, interesting enough, people have been fairly generous about it. Um, yes, the neoconservatives have not liked the book. But I think they've been actually responsible in their critique. And they've raised some pretty good arguments. It's been a pretty responsible critique within the intellectual part of the new right and conservative community. The business community liked the book, which is understandable. Business Week, Financial Times, because they realize we have to deal with a global world and we need some new thinking. Neoconservatives, 
good critiques, some good arguments, didn't agree with them, but it's been, uh, it's been not generous, but at least it's been very civilized. Uh, I would say uh, the best indication of how the book was received, my first talk show was in Boston. So the first person called up and they said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> Learn from Europe? What kind of a fantasy are you living in? America is the only place where there's real equality and a dream that's worth living. This person was convinced. The next caller called in and said, no, I've lived in Europe. I have relationships in Europe, and there are ideas that we can borrow. We've got some strengths. They got some strengths. We have some weaknesses. They have some weaknesses. So I think so it's been mixed. So you weren't vilified and accused of uh, anti-Americanism? Not anti-Americanism, just people said, you're wrong. But they didn't accuse me of anti-Americanism, no, not once. They just said, you know, I don't agree with your analysis. And, and there were some, some decent arguments on the other side. I just didn't agree with their arguments. I started my talk, uh, my introduction this evening by um, discussing my own mixed feelings reading your book. I'm one of those uh, 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 after-college European experience types, only I ended up staying. And I'm now a dual national. And I, I said that I had mixed feelings about the book. On the one hand, it was music to my ears in a, a, a difficult period in Europe, and that I was uh, thrilled that you recognized and, and put into words potential that, that I think any sensible person can see. On the other hand, I said, literally, it worries me that you might just be right. Do you also have the same kind of mixed feelings about um, the demise of America at the, at the, the rise of Europe at the cost of America, the cost of the American dream? I think about this all the time, and I ask, am I being too hard on America, and am I being too soft on Europe? I ask this all the time. Sometimes, you know, you can get a, an idea in your mind and then not have enough Aristotelian or Talmudic balance to say, wait a minute, let's look at the other argument on the other side. My personal feeling is that America's in trouble, deeply polarized. Half the country has kind of a caricature of the old American dream. The other half of the country would be attracted to the European dream. They just don't know you have it. It's a well-kept secret, isn't it? It's a well-kept secret. Well, because we don't have any news about you on American television. You don't think at the media. dinner table, what do the Dutch think? Well, when you're not, you're not, you're not on the screen in movies, TV, nothing. But I do think that the one thing about America is that it's very open, in many ways much more open than Europe with all of its problems. And when we get off track, if we, if we get a new idea that seems to resonate, we can move very quickly. It's that risk-taking, optimism, that hopefulness. So I don't want to be overly hopeful, but I do think that I've seen periods where America got a little off track, I think, and it gets back on. I'm hoping that this conversation across the Atlantic, hopefully with this book, will help create part of that conversation, that we Americans can open ourselves up to some of these ideas in Europe, and you can open up yourself to some of the ideas in America, and maybe this conversation can get America back on the track. Because Americans steeped in civil society. America is steeped in the idea of community as well as competition and individuality. Uh, we're steeped in the idea of voluntary associations. So America is not an overly, just simply individualist society, although we are more individualistic than any other country in the world. But we have the civil society. We have the communities. We're losing those. So I think America, if it moved, could move quickly, Americans. But I don't know how others think here, but I think we're a little off track now. We're scared, we're polarized, we're not sure what's going on. We don't even agree with each other on so many things. But if we're off track, Europe is having doubts. That's the other problem. Yeah. It's like in a, a relationship. Just before you get married, you start to have all these doubts of why it won't work. Europe is about to close the deal to go to the next stage in its development, and everybody's getting cold feet. So I wrote the book for Europe to say, don't get cold feet. You have many problems, but own your dream and make it real. Who did you write the book for? For I us or for them? I wrote it. Who's I us, suspect I, <laughs> I wrote it equally for both. I, first, I wrote it because my wife told me to write it. That's why I wrote it. Then I wrote it to dedicate it to the Erasmus College students because I think they're the, the hope of this generation of young people around the world. And I wrote it actually right down the middle. I wrote it for Americans to say, here's some ideas. We don't have to be frightened of rethinking the American dream. Keep some of the good stuff. Maybe add some new things. The dream's an old dream. Let's update it. I wrote it for Europe to say, have confidence. Lead the way. We want to have more than one. We don't want all the burden of the world on one society. Let's Europe take to the fore and add some new ideas to the mix. Hmm. One of the
of the things you admire in Europe is the, the consensus, the cooperation, the um, mutual uh, respect for each other's opinion. On the other hand, living here, what you see on a day-to-day -day basis is that Europe is generally incapacitated by consensus. As I said, the problems here are enormous. The diversity is great, um, but you have to be patient with yourself. You're too overcritical. You want everything immediately. Remember, when we signed our Constitution, that was only the beginning of the struggle. It took us 100 years, and then we had a civil war, and many Americans killed other Americans. Then we had another 100 years until we signed the Voting Rights Act to give African Americans a vote. And we're still struggling. So when you say we're in transient, we're in eurosclerosis, we're not cooperating, be patient and look at what you've accomplished. Don't, over -grand don't make it over grandiose, but have the steady confidence to realize what you've done in 50 years. There's peace across this continent. There's open borders. There's sharing of cultures. Your young people think of Europe as an open opportunity, not little closed fortress cities. You can congratulate yourself. Take a moment and then reflect about how much is more to be done and how much steady confidence you'll need and determination to get it done. And, and understand you can always fail because history is mercurial. You have to be vigilant because it's easy to fail, it's difficult to succeed and create a new chapter. You yourself say we're stumbling along here in Europe. Um, uh, you call it a laboratory. All sorts of terms for this transitional state that Europe has been in for 50 years. How how potent can a dream be if we're still just stumbling along? Well, look at the American dream. American dream didn't include women with the, sub with the vote until, well, what, in the 20th century. It didn't include African Americans. Still doesn't include a lot of Native Americans. We have, we have a dream that's been in place. It's been powerful for some. It's not been there for others. So if we're going to use that litmus test, we can use the litmus test in America and every other country in the world. So I'm saying it's one thing to be tough. It's another thing to say that nothing we've done makes a difference. Does anyone really believe here that you have not had any great accomplishments in 50 years? Of course not. So as we say, be worthy. Without having to be arrogant, be worthy. And of course, the, the real issue here, the reason I wrote the book, is to say you better own your dream. You've been quietly doing this, but you won't own it. Now I'm saying to you, you have a dream, own it. Be responsible for it, So, We Americans, for all of our shortcomings, the American dream was a tough dream that survived generation after generation, right, Americans? We lost our currency in the last 30 or 40 years, but we had a lot of people come over and made it in our country. In my introduction, I said one of the things that is really amazing about the American dream is its tenacity. You write in your book, I found a shocking statistic, that a third of the American people no longer believe in it. Two-thirds still do. 51%. Oh, 51% only now. How can they still, when you see the, the, the poverty, the ghettos, the impossibility of, of, of earning a, a, leading a normal life on a simple income, it's so obviously become a national myth rather than anything like an attainable lifestyle. It depends on where you're living, correct, Americans? For most of us, myself included, but for most of us, we live isolated from that, right? We don't see it every day. We know it's there, but we live in, if you're an upper middle class and middle middle class, you have people in New Orleans as it was for everyone else. We know they exist, but then when we saw that they weren't taken care of, they weren't evacuated, they weren't considered, we realized the other America still exists. It's getting worse. Maybe it's a wake up call for us. I'll say two other things about New Orleans. There are two lessons we haven't yet come out of New Orleans with. One, what struck New Orleans was global warming in the name of a hurricane and now another hurricane. And we haven't come to grips with the blame. The blame is not President Bush. The blame is us. We don't want to have a national conversation. We're 4% of the world's population. We use 25% of the energy. 52% of the vehicles in America are SUVs death engines. It's all of us. It's me. It's everyone. I'm not Mother you Teresa. You don't have an SUV, do you? I don't have an SUV, oh, but we, oh. have, we, have a, we have a station wagon that doesn't get very good gas mileage. It, it's not terrible. But I'm saying that we need to come to grips. Science Magazine did a study last week that was published saying the intensity of hurricanes has doubled in the last 35 years. It's an early sign of global warming. 
But do you see any conversation in America saying we're to fault, all of us? Maybe we should have a discussion about global warming. Maybe we should ratify Kyoto. Maybe uh, Kyoto's too little, too late. We have to go much further than that and get to a renewable energy hydrogen economy and off carbon in 30 years. The second thing about New Orleans is that we always said for the last, since Reagan to Bush, to Clinton, we all said less government, more market. Less government, more market, the marketplace will take care. Let everyone make their own choices. Then the hurricane hit, and we said, where's the government? <laughs> what we have to learn is you need both. And this is where I part company with some of my, my left friends in Europe. The argument is not do you want democratic socialism or American capitalism. The better argument, because I know that debate's happening, the, which model? The better argument is to say, what does social democracy do well at in Europe, and what does it not do well at? What does American capitalism do well at? What doesn't it do well at? Use the strength of one system as the antidote to the weakness of the other. What does democratic socialism do well at in Europe? Solidarity. No one gets too far behind. You take care of each other. What don't you do so well at? Stimulate the individual opportunity. There's a paternalism that sets in, a dependency on the government. You know that. What does American capitalism do well at? We're an engine of economic growth, usually, because we stimulate the market, we innovate the market, we, we reward individual self-interest. What don't we do well at? Distribute the fruits. The invisible hand is a fiction. It tends to go to the top, which has happened in America, unless you have controls. So what I would argue for in Europe and America is to take the, both, the best of both, and that is stimulate the market, reward the market, innovate the market, because every individual wants opportunities to make something of their life. On the other hand, have strong civil society, strong labor unions, strong political parties, so that you can make sure that the fruits are broadly enough distributed so that everybody's boat is raised and not just a few. Does that make sense? I assume that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. There, no, there are neoconservatives in Europe and neoliberals who will say that doesn't make sense. But I think for most of us, we want both. I like to have personal opportunity. I like to be competitive. I like to get ahead. On the other hand, I want to show some solidarity with my fellow human being. If that's the way we are individually, why don't we have an economic system that creates a tense Talmudic Aristotelian balance so that one is an antidote to the other so we can go down that middle course and not risk extremism of a dependent state like the Soviets did or runaway market unfettered capitalism like we are, which is rewarding the few at the expense of the many. Yes, please feel free. Yeah. Um, yeah. May I introduce you Donald Kolf, whom I mentioned in my introduction. Okay. This was too tempting to jump in. Um, the, um, could you, could you help us to understand um, why Americans and, and American corporate life, but also the American policy uh, makers, uh, have such a persistent drive in exporting uh, their ideology? Because there, I think, we, we start to di diverge, because it is not a, a, a matter of, of, of in an, uh, s selecting the best items in an eclectic way. But the American way of, of uh, driving an economy is, uh, is, is based on ideology to, to a large extent. And if you look at the, the US economic policies, and if you look at the ties that are attached to um, American foreign aid, uh, you see the, the unfettered uh, capitalism and, and free markets. You see it in, in, uh, um, in, in abundance. Um, I'm, an, I've been, I'm in a business, uh, I'm a businessman. I've uh, suffered in the hands of American investment bankers and American analysts and American stockbrokers. And there is a, uh, the, the drive is, is fantastic and there is no sign of any appreciation of the, the merits and the advantages and the performance of, e of uh, the European economies at all. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm with European companies all the time and with my American counterparts, economists, business people, and you're right. We Americans tend to evangelize. You've got to be like us. We're the success. You're the failure. You see it in every business conference. And I spend most of my time with European companies. You see this in every conference. American economists coming over here and beating you up. Now, maybe you need a little bit of that. But on the other hand, you have something to offer. But because you never get to take the floor to talk about what works in Europe, we don't hear it. What's happening in Europe now, which is interesting to me, is you're beginning to borrow from each other ideas. 
There are a lot of economic models in Europe. You're borrowing flex security from Denmark. You're borrowing the Norwegian and Swedish models on social benefits. You're borrowing a little bit of the British on how to reform the market. So what you're beginning to see, and you're borrowing from some Eastern European countries, is a little bit of borrowing going on where you're learning from each other. But I, I totally agree with you. It's a one-sided show. Uh, either you're for the unfettered American market model, or you're a loser. That's how it's usually put. It's unfortunate because if we had our ears open, we could learn some things. And what I say to my business friends in America, keep your ears open. Do some listening. Maybe we can find some things we can use here. Are there any concrete things we can do to get on the radar screen? In America? I, I was trying to imagine any television, maybe a reality show. You know what would be good? Have, have a European family transported to an American suburb and have American suburban family transported to a European city. Would that be interesting? That's a new reality show, okay? I mean, I think we need a lot more cross-cultural uh, exchange. I think we need more high school exchanges. We need more college exchanges. We need a lot more mobility between not just the college educated, but the working class in my country and in Europe. The best way is to meet each other, to engage, uh, to begin to see how different cultures have something to bring to the table. So I, I don't think there's any easy route to this, but I would encourage much more ex student exchange at the high school as well as university level. That would be the beginning so Europeans would see things in America they like and vice versa. And let me say how I feel with my wife. When we spend too much time in America, we say, we got to get out of here. we got to go back to Europe. Then if we spend too much time in Europe, we say, we've had it. we got to get back to the States. You, you know what I'm saying? I'd like to be comfortable in both places, so the book is kind of selfish, saying, why can't we have a synergy so that we can have the best of both? We have someone here in our midst who has uh, transplanted himself temporarily. Uh, the writer Russell Shorto, who was uh, a speaker at the John Adams Institute recently, and writer of the book, Island at the Center of the World, about the settling of New Amsterdam. Russell, you're living here in Amsterdam for a year. What are your, how do you feel about uh, Mr. Rifkin's story? Um, well, the, the one question I had in mind was uh, when you were giving us your cartoon American and your cartoon right. European, uh, as you were ticking off the points about the American, I was thinking largely red state American. And as you were taking off the points about European, I was thinking, well, those, those could equally apply to blue state Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, in the US, the, the, the Karl Robes and the, and the Fox Newses, uh, in the last election, tried to align John Kerry with France or with Europe. Um, that's part of, this is what you were talking about a minute ago, but that's part, uh, it seems to me this is, an, and I've, uh, as Tracy said, I've been here for a month now, I'm gonna be here for a year. And so I'm just starting to, to uh, put myself into this to try to do that uh, thing where you, you stop for a moment and, and look back and look at, look at your own country in a new light. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, uh, it seems to me that that is a problem that America has that it has walled itself off, in a way, from, from being able to do this. And, uh, and because America is what it is, it's a problem for Europe, too. So uh, uh, how, does, how does America get out of that? Let me say first, um, and, and I'm glad you raised this point, uh, I'm generalizing in a one-hour talk. If you read the book, it's a pretty long book. In fact, some think it, people think it's too long. It's like 400 pages because there's so many nuances here. And one you touched on. I'd say about a half of America believes in the caricature of the American dream. My family is split. They really do believe all of it as I outlined it. But then the, the other part of my family and the other part of America would be attractive to various elements of the European dream and already think that's the America they want. Sustainability and diversity and good quality of life. So I think we're betwixt in between. And so one of the reasons for the book is to say, hey, we've already got some interest in some synergy. Why don't we see what the Europeans have to offer us? I think it's a difficult challenge. I think it's a very difficult challenge. I don't think there's any easy answers to this because so much of, of the way Europe is and America is, is culturally embedded. The communalism and paternalism here, the individualism and the sense of going alone in our country, it's pretty embedded. 
one other thing I would say about this caricature. America was much more balanced until the 1980s because we had a strong civil society that was an antidote to the powerful engine of individualism in the market, so you could have the best of both. And remember when de Tocqueville came to America, the French aristocrat, he said, what I like about America is your civil society, you, your volunteer associations. This was an antidote because part of America is that individual tradition of the Reformation, the Enlightenment. Part is the older communal tradition we brought from Europe that we saw, but especially non-paternalistic. Our voluntary societies are not paternalistic. They're from the bottom up. We lost the civil society, as you know. We began to lose it, bowling alone, as Mr. Yeah. Putnam would say at Harvard. So as the civil society has, has, has waned in the last 25 years, we haven't had enough balance, community, to balance the excesses of the market. The best situation is to have a good functioning market and a good functioning civil society so you have a good balance between the two. We're losing that balance. We have with us, uh, I've seen two, uh, two uh, hands in the, in the hall, but I'd like to give the word the floor first to someone who has spent a considerable chunk of his time and journalistic intelligence and effort investigating Europe of the 20th century. We have with us here this evening, Geert Mock. And I'd like, I'd like to ask you here to react to Mr. Rifkin's story. Thank you. A short word. I uh, was very impressed by your story and by your book. It made, uh, made me and I think a lot of Europeans very happy. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that were also the things which were happening. Um, I spent... Uh, uh, last year, the whole summer, in the United States, after uh, a few years uh, spent, I, I think indeed I spent a long time traveling through Europe, and I love to compare my European experiences with uh, experience in the same kind of experience in the, in the United States, not so long. But what struck me was um, the process of modernization and I'm curious what your, what your opinion is about that. Um, Europe has modernized itself very intensely and very quick, in fact, the last 30 years. When you come into just a small town in the middle of Spain, it is modernized. New bridges, new roads, everything, especially the civil infrastructure. You talked already about this big program uh, which Europeans have to do to connect with each other. This program is already going on in a very spectacular way. But when you come in the middle of Kansas, in just a town, nothing happened there last 40 years. Uh, and I was really, at, I was shocked by that. I saw, I, I, I'm always, I love to look at, um, uh, at civil structures like bridges and roads, especially bridges. Almost all the bridges I saw in the United States were built in the 30s or in the 60s. And uh, it gives me, an, it gave me an, an uneasy feeling. Uh, because we Europeans love, of course, our great uncle, and love to be that the uh, yeah like that our uncle is healthy. And mm -hmm. I got a feeling this is not a healthy uncle anymore. In fact, it is perhaps I felt the same. Like uh, you, you suggested a little bit, but also Timothy Guardian and Ash and others. This is an imperium which start, is starting to decline. But I pray that it not is true. So I'm very curious about your opinion about that. I think, uh, I, I travel a lot in America. And um, I think, you know, societies have an early vision which propels them, it's the juice. Sometimes you can lose, you can live, you can deplete your cachet, deplete your vision over a period of time. Sometimes you can renew it in new ways. Sometimes you lose it. I think we've had ebbs and flows in American history, but we are at a, I think we're at a dark point. We, we're not sure about ourselves. Uh, I, it didn't begin with this administration. Don't believe this is just about this administration. It began, I think, in the early 60s, this deterioration you're seeing, this, this, this self-doubt, which is leading to more 
polarized anger. Sometimes if you become insecure, you get even more of a caricature of things that don't work. It started in the 1960s when the African-American male workforce in the North was shunted out of the factories when they began to move on to the interstates and when they began to automate with numerical controls. And you remember, you older people, all those northern cities going up in smoke in the 60s, the riots, the fires. That was a big, big turning point on America's sense of who it was. The other America became very clear. Then the Vietnam War polarized us. Then the Reagan Revolution, where we saw the undermining of the American labor movement, some of which was the labor movement's own fault, but the undermining of the American labor movement so there wasn't a balance between management and labor. Then in the 90s, both Republicans and Democrats, we began to see more of this unfettered market, the Iraq War, now the second Iraq War. There's so many things in the last 40 years that have led us to have, to, to unconsciously doubt, so consciously try to become even more severe in a caricature of who we think we are. The infrastructure is deteriorated. It's the same thing that's happening in the business community where I spend a lot of my time. We're hollowing out the capitalist system for short-term expediency and for the gain of a few. We're hollowing out American communities for short-term gain. We're mortgaging our future for short-term gain. We're losing our attention span to think in terms of long duration. So when you go to parts of the country and you see that things don't seem to be uh, modernizing, there's some truth to it. Now, other parts of the country are, but overall, the infrastructure is old, the power grid is old, um, the basic services are not there, and we basically stripped it all down and said, let the marketplace rule. I'm a firm believer in the marketplace, but it should not rule. It should be a co-partner with civil society and government. You need a balance between the three. We've lost it. So I don't want to bring back big government, but what I want to do is bring back responsible government, responsible commerce, and a strong civil society so they can work in balance. I think what you saw in America, I see too. Uh, how worried am I? Worried. Uh, am I Am I perhaps seeing it with certain eyes because, uh, because I've created this, uh, this vision of it? I hope not. I hope, I hope that, that what I say is not right because we need America to be strong and just and a standard, just like we need Europe. We can't afford not to have that. So I do share your sensibilities. I've seen it myself crossing America. And more importantly, the fear and the anger and the polarization, it is lethal. You see it in Congress. You see it in communities. Americans, you see it. We all see it. Can you, can and the you media, the media is just outrageous. I mean, I can't, my wife and I didn't have TV the last year. We moved out into the country for a year. We turned it off. And then after a year, we turned on one of the talk shows. We got sick to our stomach. And the bumper stickers on the cars, my God, what is happening to the polarization? It's terrible. Can you compare the situation, I talk again about, especially about infrastructure, and, uh, with, for instance, uh, England in the 30s? I think, um, I think w what's happening in America is we're a little bit more where we were in 1926, 27, and 28. There's some economic parallels. Uh, that was the time that electricity replaced steam power. It was a big turning point in American history. Just like today, we have intelligent technologies replacing the old industries. And what happened then is uh, productivity gains were enormous. But we began to let a lot of people go. We didn't need them. We had, more, we had cheaper machinery. And of course, Henry Ford then came up with his famous speech, and he said, maybe we better rehire these people, or no one's going to buy my cars. <laughs> But what we did in the 20s, we had excess capacity, we had all this productivity gains, but we didn't have enough income broadly distributed. The labor unions weren't strong enough to close the deal. So what we had to do is we had to get people, because the wages weren't going up, we got them to spend on credit, called installment buying. So people would buy their products on credit so you could move the inventories in lieu of a, a collective bargaining agreement for labor to have better wages. You Americans have probably studied this. By 1929, Americans were totally awash in installment credit debt. And we were working at only 75% per capacity in our companies. We had a bust. What worries me now is the value of the dollar. What worries me now is the oil prices and the value of the dollar. If the dollar goes and Asia doesn't prompt us up, I have no idea what this world's going to look like. And it could go in a moment, like it did with Argentina. And the biggest issue, and I think, facing America now is at $70 a barrel, we've got a problem. 
The problem is the OPEC countries buy, sell oil and buy in dollars. As the dollar is devalued, they have to raise the price in order to keep the revenue stream going. You with me? It creates the perfect storm. The price goes up, the American and world economy falters, we go deeper into debt, and we have the brewings of a perfect storm with our currency. So I think there are a lot of big worries. Infrastructure is one of them. Self-doubt is another. Polarization. And now a global energy crisis looming on the horizon, along with global warming. We've got some big issues. America can't. Don't look to America for the answers. Look to yourselves and let Americans look to ourselves and look to you. Let's look to each other. We need to help each other here. Great. Thank you. We have two questions from the hall, and then I'm afraid we'll have to end our evening. The first, I've seen you, and I will get back to you in a moment. Let me give the floor to Rick Kute, journalist at Elsevier, with whom I crossed swords on TV recently. We both uh -huh. crossed swords. Uh, I just lost smiles to, uh, this, tonight. Uh, Mr. Rifkin, you started out with some memories of your youth when I, as a fascinated boy of 20 years old, uh, spent my first day in America. It was in New York. I came by ship. Um, I came across a big signboard over N Macy and said, if you don't look what you are, uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, please come in. We've got it for you. And that's still, for me, the perfect um, <laughs> parabole of, of America. And when I come back, I still find a lot of it in your wonderful country. My question is this. Um, if we take the European Union on a world scale or as an aspirant, world player, um, and you, you, you say time and again, it's, it's, it's marvelous, it's a great achievement. Uh, same is said by Robert Kagan, a neoconservative, he says, and it's a miracle in the small book twice, he says it's a miracle. But to my mind, there's a big, big but, there are many buts, of course. Uh, one of them, it's so awfully slow, and that probably cannot help with 25 and probably 30 30 member, member countries, the kind of United Nations, and the Mushawara, and it, it takes the Un European Union an enormous amount of time to get its act together. And now my question to you is that in the future, will countries like your own country, the United States, not get very impatient, there's not so much patience in the United States, not very impatient with this beautiful, dreamlike phenomenon of, of Europe and do business with, with countries like Russia, China, India, Brazil, which have the big advantage of being member, uh, nation states. Too. Thank you, Rick. I think not. Europe's the biggest internal market in the world, and it's going to be the biggest internal market for a long time to come. I think India and especially China have their own problems. We're over empowering uh, what we think is the China phenomena. We see Shanghai on the news. We see 100 million people shopping in beautiful shopping malls. We don't see the other 1 billion people. The real story in China, if you know a little bit about what's going there, is massive rural depopulation, millions of people going to the urban areas, no jobs. So China may not be the future. You know, we always complain, can we have the manufacturing back from China? Guess what? Even though China has the manufacturing, they've eliminated 15% of all their factory workers in seven years to automation because the cheapest worker isn't as cheap as the intelligent technology. And that's true across the world. So what I'm saying here is there are so many problems in the world. China is, is not necessarily the miracle everyone thinks it is. India may be in a little bit better condition for some other reasons. But I, we can't say no to Europe. We're not going to go elsewhere. We're so interlocked. Our, our, our manufacturing, our service industries, our banking, our insurance, there's interlocking companies, there's companies that own large parts of America from Europe and vice versa. We're too locked. Like it or not, we, we are completely bonded like Siamese twins. But one twin has a different idea about what should be done than the other. We're not going to get away from each other. And when people say, well, you're from Mars, we're from Venus, I remind them that both those planets are in the solar system and are derived from the sun. <laughs> okay? So we're relatives, we're bound together, we have different ideas of where to go. I'm not worried about the U.S. abandoning Europe. What I'm more concerned about is how we create an intelligent conversation so we can begin to empathize with each other's strengths. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question for this evening.
Yes, Mr. Rifkin, thank you very much for your lecture. I enjoyed it very much. Um, and you're calling for a change in, in perspective of, of the political system that we have. How is this change going to be implemented? Is it going to be implemented top down or bottom up, basically? Well, this is what the last gentleman was talking about, too. I, I, I have to say, I, I don't think this is about Brussels. You're putting too much weight on Brussels. Brussels isn't going to do any of this. Look, what made the America what it is, Americans, is our dream. It was our civil society. It was our belief in each other. How many Americans spend a lot of time thinking about Washington until recently? We, we do our lives. We have a social covenant. We have, until recently, a dream, and we get on with it. What I'm saying is what, what Europe needs to do is focus less on the elites in Brussels, although there needs to be more democratic participation. I'm glad Brussels exists. I'm glad you've opened the borders. But it's up to your generation now to cement the glue with that new European dream. So that when you look at each other, young people, you know that's the covenant. That's the mission you jointly share. That's the legacy you want to leave. And when you raise your kids, you raise them on the European dream, just like we raised our kids on the American dream. If that glue is tight, and you really develop that esprit de corps and believe in that dream as your mission and legacy, that's what you will need to make Europe a place where everyone can live comfortably with each other and really advance with prosperity, and I don't mean just economic, but social prosperity into the future. If you think it's all about Brussels or regulations or and directives, you know that's just not true. It isn't about that. It's about how we show affection with each other and how we share a vision of a better life for our children in our very personal lives in our community. So I think it starts with the bottom. I think it starts with the dream. You bear a heavy responsibility. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Rifkin, for your very engaging speech. It was very um, interesting, and I think many of us will have another opinion and maybe a stronger belief in our self and the European dream we have to own. Thank you, um, Tracy, for giving the introduction. Thank you for um, sparing with uh, Mr. Rifkin. He took a lot of time, but I think it was worth it. And I hope it's not too late for everybody. Have still have some drinks with us. Um, hope you will have time to come again next week, because next week we have a busy week. The 29th, we'll have Michael Cunningham in the Rode Hoed. And the 30th of September, so it's the next day, can't believe it myself, we'll have Tom Wolf in the Renaissance Koepelzaal. So there's still tickets, I believe. So if you want, you can sign up quickly. Thank you for coming tonight, and I hope Mr. Rifkin can stay a little bit longer to sign some books. I don't know how busy his schedule is, but maybe he can stay a little bit longer. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.